we've had loads of questions coming in and, and if i might i'd like to um put them into sections uh, and if we can can we start firstly with the flare static situation and then we'll move on to to covid and vaccinations and so on which i know there's an enormous amount of interest in that mm -hmm. um from my own point of view the flare trial has been um, known uh internationally for a long time as a, as a major trial looking back what would you say was the the major um achievement of the trial mm -hmm. I made my hair grey, and that's the starting point, uh, I think. Um, but so it's been a, it's been. Um, I think the the real sort of positives from that has been a very positive experience. I think for the for patients and for the for the community in, in the UK, has been we we got the approval to do the trial very early. So even before it was, the drug was approved, we we had uh, we got access to the drug in frontline, and and I think that that allowed many patients in, in the UK to go into the trial way before um, even it was approved. And, and, um, and the question that we, we, we've asked, and uh, we are asking, we've able to adapt it to ask really important questions going forward. So, so what FLIR will do um, is, first of all, we, we should get some results, hopefully within the next 12 months. So we, we, we have to wait for, for events to happen before we can re report the trial. And the better therapy you have, the longer it takes to get to the events. Um, so in some ways, having being taken, I guess the best part of 10 years since we thought of the trial to get the results is a good sign that FCR is a good treatment for CLL, um, uh, as long as you tolerate it, and, uh, and I've written a bit, but we are very close to, to seeing the results of the first part. And that will allow us, because it's a much bigger trial than, than other trials that have been run uh, with this, that question, to look at all the important um, subgroups of patients so you know the good risk patients the or mutated vh mutated you know is the advantage seen in those patients to to i suspect will i hope will show that fcr shouldn't be used that in any group of patients but that obviously has got to be driven by the science and so we'll look at that data that's the first part the second thing which i think has been and i have to thank my team in the, in the university of leeds because they've been really um uh, imaginative in a way that and and and, and and dogged in doing it on other companies is adding in the combination. So adapting a trial while it's going to add in another 800 patients uh, and two more questions. So I boost them alone, I boost them plus phonetic lax. Uh, it's not even approved yet, that combination, and, we, and we've already finished reproducing the trial. And that's the future, probably, for at least some patients, uh, that we'll have results out you know, soon after around the time of approval. And that's really important when we get to the funding issues. So NICE will look at the data. And if we have a large number of patients treated with a combination, which shows an advantage, then it's much more likely that we'll get funding quickly and, and future patients will benefit. So, so I think it's been a really um, uh, sort of landmark study actually. And, and uh, um, we're already building static and the, the next trial after FLAIR and the group within the UK generally this is a, not just Leeds, it's across the whole country. Uh, it's, it's very strong, I think, and, and we'll have good trials going forward. Excellent. Good news. Um, you, you covered this during your talk, but could we just reiterate it so that uh, people who are watching can, can be absolutely certain? Part of the FLAIR, the FLAIR trial partly is coming towards an end. And, and um, so if, if people are on ibrutinib, what are their alternatives if they're on the trial? Yeah. So, so the, the recruitment has come to an end, Brian. So, so it's important to say that the patients in Flare will remain in Flare and will be we looked after by the, the trials teams and be followed uh, for years to come. And so, um, uh, and we'll continue to follow patients. So, so no one's it's it's not ending, but recruitment has to end. Um, we, as I said before, we when we designed trial the trial, we we weren't sure how long to use ibrutinib for. We, we we looked at all the evidence we had. In fact, initially it was three years, and we extended it to six for a variety of reasons. Um, and uh, I think, and I'm actually very comfortable with that decision because uh, most patients will get a very good response early, early on with ibrutinib and then will actually be in remission uh, in terms of clinical remission for most of the time on, on ibrutinib. And um, a key question going forward is, is, is do we need to continue the drug continuously or can we stop and start? Because it may well be that with a stopping and starting approach, we can keep patients responding for the rest of their lives and, and they and they don't have to worry about resistance to treatment uh, but we want to be certain about that 
So we've been working very hard, actually, and it's been two years uh, of hard negotiations with a variety of people to get to the point we are now. So um, I, I don't want to put off my young investors here coming through about the, the, the determination you have to have, but we have very good support. So the choice is now coming off a flare. So, so the patients will have had, this is the patients randomised to the ibutinib containing arm, not, not the FCR arm, the FCR arm uh, patients, if they need further treatment, we have lots of options, which will off trial, so that so we've been including a calor and Ben and ibrutinib, so so that's an issue. So the ibrutinib patients, which is the majority, will have had six. Either they'll stop because they went in a deep remission, which is good, and they won't need to. We won't need to worry about those. But the patients on ibrutinib alone or had rituximab, uh, ibrutinib are likely to still be on treatment if they tolerated it. At six years, uh, they they'll have the choice of stopping treatment, which is what the flare treatment, and staying in follow up in flare. And having whatever treatment in the future they may need. Uh, going into static, we'll, we'll aim to have all the sites open because uh, the site, the hospitals have to be open to recruit. And then in static, they can, the mo most patients hopefully will go into the randomization cohort. So they'll then, before the end of, just at the end of flare, will be randomized to continuing ibutinib in static or, or pausing treatment. Uh, and then we will follow them every three months as we would normally. And then if there's any sign of, of the lymphocytes going up or the lymphocytes those are reappearing, restarting their boots, still within static for a period of a year, two years until they're in remission for a period and then stopping again and starting again. So it's intermittent treatment to control resistance. Um, so hopefully, and then that's the, the most logical approach to treating patients with, with CLR, I believe, in a, a, to get answers on that on that question but there was, is an option we are working on an option uh and we have agreement for, for for a patient choice for those patients who are either really anxious about stopping ibrutinib uh we don't want to force patients to stop so we're working on, on allowing them to choose to stay on ibrutinib um for those patients who may um actually have a lymphocyte count is still high at the end of flare uh, or maybe starting to to come back through ibrutinib to allow them to stay on ibrutinib while they're benefiting so we don't have to stop right. it in that situation um and so to get to cover those situations so so we're doing that now and that will be available for patients going to static I, i'm hoping and I, and I think i'm sure it's the right thing to do that the randomization would be the right is, is the most sensible because you're not stopping therapy you're pausing it and and you have that available but if you stop therapy and flare then there's a debate about what treatment you could have next. I mean, so so because it may be some years down the line. So so it does make sense. The the final group to talk about are the people who might be stopping now, because we're now over six years since the first patient went in, and we were hoping to have static open before before now, but but it's not been that straightforward. And that's probably the reason for my grey hair, really. Um, so the the we will allow patients in flare that will stop at six years, but then can go into static when it's open and can choose either patient choice to, to restart it or be randomized at that point. So, so the static trial will be available to, to all patients coming off flare, um, unless they're progressing or have other problems, in which case we'll, we'll try and make, we'll hopefully make everything available for them. Right, thank you. Um, still on that, that topic, a couple of questions which I'll combine together uh, coming in about this. Uh, the first one says, I've been told by my consultant to be prepared to start treatment for my CLL uh, for the first time later this year. How do I find out whether or not the static trial would be suitable for me? And the other question, which is uh, similar, how do I find out if the static trial is available at my hospital? Uh, they're in Cumbria, uh, yes. in Scotland. Uh, it, uh, it was not on the list of centres for the flare trial. So uh, how does a patient know whether they can get That's on good. I should have mentioned, and I, I, I did mention when I was speaking, that uh, that half the patients just under half will come from flare the other half will come from uh patients who have had ibrutinib have you know in relapse so most of our patients who have been on it yeah they have to have been on treatment for two years so you don't start ibrutinib in the in static because we because it's for patients who are in a good remission uh on ibrutinib uh treatment will go into 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 static um and they we would anticipate 100 centres around the UK to be open ma mainly the flare centres but, but we're obviously open for other centres um and then uh so hopefully all the flare patients will have access to them but the non-flare patients um there will be hospitals near cumbria or wherever the 
the, 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 the patient is that have flare open. We have a very good geographical spread uh, of, of sites open. So, so I think if patients are interested in, in static, um, uh, then and if it's not open in, the, in their hospital, probably inquiring with their, their consultant, to, you know, do they know if it's open nearby and, and, uh, and would it be possible to, to consider going into the trial there? Just to reiterate, they have to have already been on Arbutinib. Yeah, so, so they'll have been on Arbutinib for at least two years and be in a good response. We are working on a trial for the, to replace Flair uh, with the next question. But the challenge, of course, I mean, which is a good challenge to have, is that the treatments are, are so effective. How do, what's the next question we need to ask? And we have lots of other therapists coming along and, and we're, we're getting there. So hopefully <laughs> good. Uh, we'll have a for the trial soon. <laughs> Good. Okay, I, I'm just going to go on to a few general questions that have come in. Um, one says that trials frequently exclude patients who may have comorbidities. Why is this? And does the trial therefore give a real world representation? Now that's a really important and good question as well. So, so first of all, if you think about the phases of trials that we do, um, a lot of the treatment, a lot of the trials are around safety. So collecting to making sure what we do to patients doesn't harm patients and the safety of the of the drugs as well. So that you know, if we anything we report, and this is a good thrombosis is a good example in the, in the vaccine trials. Anything that happens to a patient in a trial is reported as potentially caused by the by the treatment. So if you get hit by a bus, it's, it's an adverse event. Um, and uh, you know, and, and you you saw Jonathan Van Tam talking about the paracetamol. And that's because we report everything. Uh, if you if we include patients with a lot of comorbidities, um, first of all, it may increase, for example, the, the, the toxicities that are seen, uh, and that have to be reported as drug related. They may not be, even if it's not related to it. Uh, and secondly, you know, if it's something like a cancer, a second cancer that, that that had a relatively short um, expected survival, then that would mean that actually you wouldn't want to put them in a trial where they couldn't benefit from. So, so there are issues like that. But the question's completely right. The real world data, uh, you know, we, we end up then with a selected group of patients uh, that, that are younger, fitter, um, uh, prepared to travel, et cetera. And, and what we're, what's changed in the last few years is the real world data. So we're starting to collect data, um, you know, in the CL forum, do it in, in the UK on everybody exposed to the treatment, hopefully, uh, in the real world, and then report that data to see if the real world data mirrors the data in trials. And, and to be fair, the, with the ibrutinib, acarbutinib, and the, uh, the less so, because we've got less data, and venetoclax, the data looks pretty pretty solid, actually. So the, even the ones with patients with comorbidities seem to benefit uh, in a similar way um, to the treatment. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Um, a couple more uh, on general topics and then we move on to the the key topic of today which is uh, the covid and vaccinations and so on um this one here says all treatments um uh, tend to have side effects for at least some patients for example um atrial fibrillation in ibrutinib which is well known and neutropenia uh, do you think that these side effects will be reduced or even eliminated with the next generation of new treatments that are coming along yeah so so the answer is yes, that's what the aim is. So, so if I look at the development of CLL therapies, I don't really have time to talk about it, but I'll mention it very briefly. Um, the next generation uh, is probably the more specific inhibitors. So, so I recently targets about 10 different uh, molecules, including the one we want, and that leads to some side effects. We, we're never quite sure which one that's targeted is causing which side effects. So it's always, it's, you know, the, and in some respects, dirtier drugs, if you like, can be effective in other ways. So, so you know, we always have to tease that out. The acarbutinib and the next one, zanubrutinib, are more specific. They have about four different things they target. So we would expect them to have less side effects. But we have to prove that in the trials. Uh, and so the, the early data for acarbutinib suggests that there's less high blood pressure, less irregular heartbeats um, in, in, in those patients, and probably less diarrhea and, and other side effects, although we we replace that with headaches as a side effect for a at least in the first few weeks of treatment. So, so the, you can have different side effects with a different drug. Uh, and what we really need is a comparative. So just as, just because you have high blood pressure, does that mean if you switch to another drug, it's going to improve? Well, we don't know that. So you have to do trials to test that. And we have head-to-head -head trials comparing our to a uh, which are 
cooking at the moment and uh, will be reported probably this year, which will give us a much more granular sort of uh, say to say how much better or not they are compared to my brutinib. So our expectation is, uh, my expectation is I've used a lot of acal brutinib that, that we would see less of the side effects. But I think what's important to highlight is that 80% of patients are fine. I mean, you know, and they have one, you know, once a day tablet as opposed to twice a day tablet. And, and, uh, and we've got lots of data with our brutinib. And so um, I, I wouldn't want the person asked the question or anyone to go away thinking that, that we've got a, you know, a bad drug and a good drug. I mean, they're, they're both phenomenally better than we had five years ago, 10, year, 10 years ago. Um, and it's whether, and we're, whether we're tweaking it to make it better with a car. Now, the next generation beyond that, which are dealing with the resistance are, are a different class as well, but they target the same thing. So we're already moving on to the next next series of therapies uh, for those patients who I've got a lot of patients who have had who have looked after for many years and and they've got because they've been in a trial they've they've done well and then they've survived to the next trial and and we keep you know, it's a strategy over time and say like you've got to think what's coming next and what's the you know we, we can't rest on our laurels. Although having said that, I think with the frontline use of these drugs, we're probably going to break that cycle. I think we're going, we're getting to the stage where where we're getting such durable remissions that 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 hopefully we won't get to third and fourth line therapies. Do do you think that would lead to a cure at some point? Yeah, I was I was banned from using the word cure in my lectures by my <laughs> statistician some years ago, but um, but a few years ago she allowed me to do it to do it, and and uh, I think. We know that with FCR that maybe, you know, 15% of patients from our experience will never relapse. And so, so that's what we have to beat. And then we know that's due to depth of remission. So the, the patients, if you get more people with no de technical disease, you get more people who are going to be in that state. So I, I believe we are curing some patients. We don't know who until 10, 15 years later, which is a challenge. Although we're, we're trying to understand that. Uh, and as we get more effective combinations, I'm hoping that we're going to see even higher percentages. So I think what we're doing with CLL um, for CLL is is changing to a disease which is manageable for most patients and potentially curable for some going forward. Um, there may well be um, uh, the patients who have had lots of treatment before um, where the disease is more resistant uh, are more challenging in terms of controlling the disease. And that's why we need these new therapies that are taught about. Thank you for that, Peter. C can we just uh, move on now to COVID and vaccination questions? Because I know this is a, a very hot topic at the moment. Um, here's a very simple one. Can can I've had the COVID vaccination. Uh, could this have led to uh, increased antibody production and then contribute to my suddenly enlarged nymph nodes? Okay, so there's no there's no evidence that, that that and there's no reason that a vaccination would would fundamentally change someone's CLL. So it's not it's not you know it's not stimulating the CLL cells. Uh, it's you know I, you've got to consider a vaccination to be similar to your normal immune system. So we're all being exposed to bugs all the time, and we're all raising immune responses to them all the time. And uh, and what we're doing with the vaccine is giving you a big bolus of a specific bit of the virus that you're going to now respond to. So there's no reason why that why, why that would fundamentally change the, to that individual patient. Having said that, um, we know that in people who have, you know, acute phase reactions or immune responses, illnesses that can affect the CLL both in a good way and a bad way temporarily. So so there can be a flood. You know, if you have a vaccination in your in your arm, even if you're not got CLL, your gland, the lymph glands under your arm may swell up. And if you've got CLL, they might swell up a bit more, um, but it won't change the disease in itself. Okay, can we briefly talk about the King's College study because mm -hmm. we, we're getting so many questions about that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, having had a look at it, there are only 11 CLL patients actually mm -hmm. on the study. Right. And uh, as I, th I think you mentioned during your talk, they didn't study T-cell mm -hmm. um, response at all, which is much more difficult to do. Should people be really concerned about that study? So they, well, they did they did study T cells, but not we, we don't have the granular granularity within the CLL patient group. So we don't know. Um, uh, it, it's really not broken down enough. I mean, if you think about our patient our patients with CLL, they range from people who've just been diagnosed with stage A to people who've had you know several lines of therapy. So that they're, they're or, you know 
11 patients is never going to give us the information we need, of course. Uh, and that's why we have the big trials studies ongoing. Um, I ex we expected that patients with CLL would have the, the, likely to have less of a response to the vaccine than someone with a normal immune system. That was entirely predictable from all the evidence we have. And, and even within co the COVID pandemic, uh, patients who see a lot of patients who catch COVID take longer to clear it and, and probably get iller. So, so as a, someone with a, a normal immune system may clear the virus usually in a, in a week or, or two. Some of our patients are still positive you know, a month or two later. So, so that's natural infection causing immunity and, and the vaccine is not going to be any different to that. It might be better because it's designed to stimulate the immune system, uh, but it's no great surprise. I think what was, and we have to take it into context. So these were uh, assays, serological assays done at day 21. So the, the immune system is still reacting at that point before the second one. And, we're, and the, the, so the headline data is antibody serology, which is not, not everything we need to know about, so to know if you're protected. But it is worse than, than the normal, than someone without CLL. So I think concern would be the right thing to say. Um, I think it won't capture the full immunity of a patient with CLL because it's early, it's one test, it's not after two vaccines, we need more data. Uh, it, it doesn't capture who's on treatment, um, who's been off on chemotherapy before, clearly. Um, but it certainly justifies our uh, studies to look at, at responses. We have 13 different tri uh, studies in the UK, I think, for haematology patients, of which a couple that will, will include CLL patients in them uh, and uh, many other groups of patients. And we expect to see data, I think the King's College was the first one of those type of studies, but we'll, we expect to see increasing data maybe over the next month or two. So we, I mean, and we'll collect information on it. I think the important message, and I'll ask one of the questions was, it's really important for patients not to assume you've had your vaccine and therefore I'm safe. Because... Um, the way I've been describing it really is that, you know, the government are right that a four week, it takes four weeks to see the impact of a change in, in our behaviour on the pandemic. And if what we don't want to do is relax our, our guard and then find we're in the middle of a, of a spiking infection as a CLL patient, you really don't want to be in that situation. So you're much better being a bit behind the curve. I mean, it's not necessarily what patients want to hear, but, but, but what's really important is we are getting the rate of infection down. It will come down in the summer anyway, and we'll get to levels where the chance of you meeting someone with the virus is very low, and, and then you're safer. But And we'll have more information about the vaccinations then. We may, you may be looking at booster injections. We will look at, at, at what the best way to protect our patients is, uh, both on treatment and not on treatment. Um, so I apologise that I can't, say to everyone just go out and party um, or in my, many of our patients see your children and grandchildren freely which is obviously uh, important uh, but I think we have to be cautious. That, that does answer a lot of questions that uh, have come in such as I've, I've, it's three weeks since my first injection can I go out and act as normally the, the answer must be no you have to still uh, be very very careful. I think uh, careful di distancing all those precautions as we, as we relax as we can things open outside, I think, you know, um, that's fine. You know, playing golf is obviously very important to some of us. And that's, you know, you can do it distant, in a distance way. That's that's important. So so just being sensible and taking precautions. Um, uh, and we're getting there. And there's, there's a lot of progress. I think travel abroad is a challenge. I mean, a lot of people ask me about traveling abroad. I think there's less certainty, certainly as things are at the moment. And I wouldn't be planning on doing that until we know that we are protected um, over there. Um, so, uh, yeah, be careful. Thank you. Are you concerned at all about the 12 week delay in vaccination? I think in, in general terms, you know, for non serial patients, no, I think that's a very sensible strategy. You know, we've, you know, half the adult population are vaccinated, which is an incredible achievement um, for, you know, in, in the period of time we've been vaccinating. And, and that has an impact on the hospitals and on the care people can get and, and, and obviously on, eventually on the infection rate. So no, but I think for our patients uh, who may not respond, you know, 
normally to vaccines, it is a concern that, that uh, you know, you've got to remember these trial, how these trials are done. So these, the reason why three weeks is there is that the, the, the main trial for the, for the BioNTech or four weeks for the other trial, some of the other trials, is done on that schedule. So it's a bit like using ibrutinib in CLL. You can only test what you've tested. You don't know if it's six weeks or eight weeks, but you can look at all the evidence and say, OK, well, people got really high immune re- re- reaction at, at three weeks. Therefore, it's not going to be, from all our previous experience, at four weeks, it's still going to be high and eight weeks, it's going to still be, still be high. So it, ma- it makes sense. That's why we need the data in, in serial patients and, general, and our hematology patients generally, so that we can actually answer that question. I think, you know, if we could get shorter interval, that would, I'm not sure whether it would reassure you that you can go out, but 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 we know that that does seem to 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 improve the responses. So um, it may be that some patients we 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 say, well, actually, somebody on this treatment isn't going to respond, you know, and and we need to think of other strategies, you know, that, that there's the long-acting antibodies and other things that are coming through. So so it's about knowledge and and then getting the best protection for our patients. Well, uh, that knowledge comes, of course, with experience. You, we have mm-hmm. to go through that experience to, to understand what exactly is happening. Mm-hmm. Can we touch on, on antibodies for a second? Um, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people have contacted us, uh, about 10 or 12 uh, here now, uh, concerned because they've tested negative for antibodies mm-hmm. after receiving a vaccination. Mm-hmm. And I, I just wonder, is, is this because they've had the wrong type of test? And should they be buying home tests anyway? Are no, they accurate? Sort of- yeah, so the okay, we can split the tests into the sort of uh, the laboratory tests that you have in the hospital and the ones that you might buy, uh, you know, sort of on, online or, or wherever you get it. So, so first of all, laboratory-based tests are obviously validated, and we know that the, that the test um, will test what's in that sample. It doesn't tell you, obviously, in the PCR test whether you've missed. You know, throttle your throat or anything. It's got to be in the sample or, or in that or in, that, or in the, the blood test to a threshold. So, so it can't pick up one antibody in a sample. It's got to pick up a level. That, so that each test will have a certain threshold that, that where it becomes positive. What we can do, and the, the next generation of tests coming through, this is just an aside, is actually we'll quantitate that that level of antibody. So, so in, I think in April we're expecting the, the first plates to look at you know not just are you positive or negative, but how positive are you. Um, and we do that with other antibodies. Um, in terms of the the home test, it's much harder to give advice because they're not validated. They're off. I mean, many of them, and uh, they may be they may be good tests, but they may not they may not be good tests. They may. And the other worry would be what what happens if they give false positives? So so a false negative is at least you then protect you don't go out, but you may get a false positive test. So you're actually negative, and it says you're positive, and then you get then you think you're, you're protected and you potentially you're not. So in terms of, and I saw a question came to you before about can you get tested um, for your serology to the to the vaccine? Well, we, there are, the tests are available. We've been using it for natural infections and for for serology, you know, to vaccines. The challenge we have is we don't know how protective they are. So so if you've got an t- antibody, does that mean you're protected? And we, we don't know that. It's better to have the antibody than not have the antibody, certainly. But how does it change what you do? If you're going to have the uh, serology test, I think the time to have it is after the second dose. You want to have it at the time when you've had the best chance of responding. So at least two weeks after the second dose. Um, I think at the moment it is of interest, not rather than fundamentally changing what we're going to do. It may be in future that actually we say, oh, if you've got an antibody, you're protected. So that's fine. That might be the case. Hence, the studies are important. Or it might be we say, if you've not had an antibody, we've got to give you another boost. So, so it's the sort of thing that will be useful going forward to really try and sort of tailor our, our uh, vaccine strategy to an individual patient and, the, and what they should do. But we just don't have the data uh, no. now to, to, to rely on that. Yeah. Am I right in saying that the, the, there are two types of tests uh, and most people are using the test to see whether they've had COVID itself. Mm-hmm. And that test doesn't uh, detect the antibodies as a result of the vaccination. So the it should pick up, I'm not sure, it depends on which test you use, but but the because the vaccine, you're using just the spike protein. So you're using parts of the virus, if you like. Uh, so a, a natural immune response could react, would probably react to the spike protein because that's on the outside, but but would maybe react to other bits of the virus as well. So we see this with other viruses as well, that, that you can tell 
in some viruses, whether it's been an infection or a vaccine that's caused the response because the vaccine will only have a response to the spike, whereas the, the general sort of infection will have a more general general re reaction to it. So you can sort of tell, you know, uh, in some vaccines, uh, they're not sure quite there with the COVID serology yet, but that's developing really rapidly um, in terms of our understanding. And then, as I mentioned before, you can look at the levels of, of um, protection when you get some more refined tests. Good, thank you. Uh, we're running out of time, so a couple of very quick questions, because I, I know you have an, uh, a commitment uh, straight after this, Peter. Um, uh, a very, very simple one. I've had the, vac the first vaccination, but the rest of the household haven't had theirs. Should I continue to shield? Yeah, so we've, we, one of the things we've been lobbying for is, to, is, to, is that um, the, the patients with haematological cancers and certainly CLL, that the, the, the sort of nearest and nearest and people who live in the houses should be vaccinated because we know that that reduces the risk to the person in the house. There's, there's a, a trial out this week showing a, a significant reduction if you've had if your partner's been vaccinated for you getting the, the infection. And so I think there's a strong case that other members of the family should be vaccinated. You can't let your guard down that that, that um, if they've not been vaccinated, and even, I mean, it's likely, and there's evidence that, that the vaccination stop reduced the spread now, but that's still developing, that story. Uh, but if they've not been vaccinated, uh, and it's my experience is the sort of kids at university and school that, that, that you want back in the house, you, you still have to take precautions, I think, until until we know the rate of infection is low and, and, our, and our loved ones are, are protected. Sure, sure. Uh, final question, very quickly. Um, you, I'm sure you probably won't be able to answer this one anyway, but is there any evidence for having more than just the two vaccinations, maybe a third vaccination as a, as a booster, perhaps? Well, we know in other vaccines of that that, that, uh, that that sometimes you have to boost boost the response. Now, the, the, there's, there's several ways to answer that question. First of all, it may be variants. So fortunately, though, so far, the vaccine seems to be effective against variants, but actually a specific bo booster against the variant, which has been worked on, may be even more effective against any variants. And that might be important, particularly if people are going to be traveling in places where there's lots of variants around. And so that's the first, the first thing. Secondly, um, the, the maybe uh, you would, for patients who have had a suboptimal response but are responding, it may well be that the boosters are necessary more often. So we, we need to know how not only how well people respond, but how long does that response last for? Because if you're immune now, say two weeks after your second vaccine, and maybe in six months it's gone. And so, so it's, that's going to be important information uh, going forward. And then the final thing I'd say is there are trials going and looking at using one vaccine for, and then a second different vaccine. Um, and there's some uh, vaccine, vaccine strategies that actually works better. So we do that with newer vaccines. We use, we do use a different vaccine for the two, the two doses. And so it may, may be that, that actually we pick a different vaccine, different type of vaccine to get a better immune response going forward. Uh, I do have to um, say that, you know, it's, was it December the 8th when uh, our first patient was, was person was vaccinated in the UK and we're now only in March. So these are questions we're going to collect information on. Still early days yet. Peter, I, I want to thank you very much indeed for being so generous with your time. It's, it's very much appreciated. And uh, I'll let you carry on to your next appointment now. Thank, thank you very much indeed. We're, we're extremely grateful. Thank you, Brian. My pleasure.